So I'm going to be focusing on the place where I've been uh, living and working for the last five years and uh, where I've been part of the development for the last ten years. Um, but before I do that, well, now let's, let's just go on to the next, keep this moving here. Um, so as I did yesterday, I don't want to repeat myself for people that were uh, part of the conference yesterday, but once again, I'd like to put Kohausen into a larger context. Uh, so I'm talking about co-production and I'm talking about commoning. So I, 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 would, I would like to see co-housing not just as an exercise for architects, which is, is something in itself, but as something for all of us in our cities uh, or wherever we are living in terms of producing housing that connects to our neighborhoods, our cities, and our, our local environments. And so I use this idea of commoning, uh, remembering us that, uh, uh, that, that humans in Ireland, as, as well as ever, everywhere else in the world up until the last one or two centuries, were basically living in, in smaller structures, either called villages or something else, and based around the ideas of the commons where people had ideas of shared ownership, especially uh, shared access to land and resources. Um, I would like to add something that's not even part of the presentation, some news from Berlin in that context. Um, also reminding us not just of, the, of the, this movement towards uh, understanding what the commons can mean, but the political aspect of co-housing and housing. Maybe some of you have gotten the news from Berlin, but there are some initiatives um, gathering speed. One of them just submitted their, their signatures to the government. Yesterday they collected 77,000 signatures to uh, start the process of asking the government to expropriate uh, hundreds of thousands of apartments from the largest um, housing landowners. Remembering most people in Berlin are renters, so this is something different maybe from Dublin or, or London. But anyway, a, a, significant, a significant step. Um, and so I'm just making the point at the beginning that considering co-housing uh, also was a political, uh, political challenge to put co-housing into a context of, of, of uh, housing struggles uh, around us. So let's move on quite quickly. I'm with this institute in Berlin. We organize events like SOA is doing here for the last 15 or 20 years, every year for, well, since 2003, this experiment days, the online platform Cohousing Berlin, and publications like Cohousing Inclusive, uh, which uh, the exhibition is coming out of, uh, part of the exhibition, which you can see in the entry space. So what is Cohousing? Uh, I, I don't see it much differently than the, the guys from SOA. Uh, it means, first of all, self-organization, so this is going beyond just uh, normal ideas of participation, challenging architects to, uh, to really work with, <laughs> work with their clients, work with future residents, uh, to uh, facilitate, moderate, and help people achieve what they're really after in their own lives. Uh, Community-led, so I, some idea of community really has to be uh, out in front. It's not just a bit of community tacked on and maybe some community meeting space, but really uh, supporting the development, maintenance of uh, strong local communities of people. The idea of sustainability or, or regeneration, I think, should also be uh, included. Um, if it's done well, then these other things can, can be added into it, innovation, empowerment, inclusion. And beyond that, and, and I bring in the political idea once again, a paradigm shift. So uh, collectively uh, redefining um, how, how we understand housing, how, how, we, how we develop it, uh, how we manage it, how we main it, maintain it, and, and how we own it. Why do people get into co-housing? So looking at it a bit more from the personal side, what are the usual motivations? Um, especially in our large, whoops, the pr presentation is running away from me. Um, a response to this uh, extremely individualized, extremely, uh, well, competitive urban society, helping us to uh, reduce 
uh, loneliness, which has turned into uh, an epidemic uh, in, in our cities. Um, Co-housing helping us, not just architects, but people, uh, to, to find housing that is, that is not being developed by the market, meaning that the free market or profit oriented developers, and that's also not being developed by the state. Um, recognizing that demographics are changing, our cities, uh, Dublin and everywhere else, are already diversified and they're rapidly diversifying, and the housing is just not keeping up with that, the way people are, the way they're living, the way they want to live. Anyway, you, you can see the list. I don't need to read through them all, but anyway, there are some important motivations, and I, I think uh, um, it's important just to uh, understand where people are coming from. Again, not just as architects helping these people, but to understand what's driving people these days. Um, I'm focusing on Berlin. That's, that's where I've been living and working for the last 25 years. I talk about co-housing cultures. So I think if we're doing what could be called successful co-housing, we have to understand where people are in a particular city or a particular neighborhood. What are their experiences? What are their expectations? What are their fears? What are they used to? So you can't just give them something that's completely new and shocking to them. You have to pick them up where they are or do a lot of education and, and bring them along. In Berlin, in any case, our co-housing, or what we understand to be co-housing, is influenced by Scandinavian developments, especially Denmark and Sweden, strongly influenced by the, the very strong tradition of the housing cooperative um, in Berlin, going back more than 120, 130 years. More than 10% of the housing in, in Berlin is, is owned and managed by, by cooperatives, so it's not a, a fringe development in any way. Uh, this is also the model of the, of the Spreyfeld, where I'm involved, uh, where I'll be talking about. But more informal structures like shared flats, which students are quite familiar with, perhaps also in the city. Um, anyway, it means understanding these, uh, these different histories. Um, another strong tradition in Berlin is self-help projects the government had for a couple of decades uh, a very large program um, to uh, support people in the old buildings where they were to get these buildings renovated and help people develop their own local communities. Let's go into the Sprayfeld project. Um, so I'm going to talk about the cooperative, which is called the Spreyfeld, Bauern Wohngenossenschaft, so the cooperative for, for developing and, and managing housing. And I'll also talk about what's called the Spray VG. That's a smaller cluster apartment group or shared flat arrangement where I'm, I'm at home. This is what it looked like in the planning phase going back uh, six, seven, eight, nine years. Um, three buildings developed on what was uh, not a extremely difficult piece of land, but where a lot of co-housing projects get to build are, are pieces of land where other investors don't like to go. This piece of land was available. Uh, it wasn't buildable because it didn't have a street address. Um, that's what made it more affordable for us. Um, this is what it looked like after finishing construction, 2014. Interesting about the Spreyfeld, and I think significant is, is that it is an understanding co-housing, uh, which has an emphasis on the residential aspect. It's, it's not just housing. It's about people living, it's about people working together uh, and, and doing other things. Uh, what you can see here, children from uh, the daycare. So in terms of integration with the neighborhood or inclusion with the neighborhood, um, children are coming and going from the surrounding neighborhood and uh, spend their days here in the uh, community's courtyards. It's also about things like mobility. So a big decision was made during the planning phase not to build a parking garage in Berlin. We're fortunate that we're not required by the local government to build new parking spaces, so we didn't. It saved us a lot of money. It gave us space to do some significant uh, landscaping or greening and uh, encouraged us to take alternative steps with our local mobility. So it means things like uh, you know, organizing bicycles like this um, so people can move things around and move themselves and their children. 
anyway ride bicycles more than uh, driving cars. Uh, for us, it means having significant community spaces. Uh, we call these option spaces, and uh, that means they're available for people that live and work in this cooperative, but they're also available for people from the larger community or the larger public. Um, that means people are coming and going. We're not just uh, in, in any way a gated community, but people are actually coming and going in every day. People have different reasons to, to come to our spaces. People can ask to use them or, or, or rent them for their own meetings, for their own parties, uh, cooking and eating together, uh, whatever. Um, yeah, examples of, uh, of uh, meetings that go on in our spaces. Um, here's a meeting of the, of the, of the cooperative. Uh, we're organized as a cooperative structure, so that means uh, the adults that live there are members. Uh, we have a monthly meeting to make major decisions. This is what it looks like from across the river. Berlin's like to protest. This is an example of a protest on water. Uh, so the protest is uh, going past our project in the last summer. Um, people getting together on the, um, the roof of, of what's called our boathouse. People working in the garden, so a part of what I, what I would understand to be sustainability regeneration is uh, doing significant greening, and for us this means uh, developing what could be called productive or edible landscapes, so relearning how to uh, grow food in open and public spaces uh, in, in the city. A lot of it is education as well, so that's part of being uh, what we call a model project, so people are coming by maybe not every day, but certainly every week. So we're doing a lot of uh, visits and tours and explanations and, and discussions of, of what we're doing and how and why. Uh, for example, here, working in one of the other open spaces that uh, uses the concept of the food forest, a bit influenced by ideas of permaculture. This is coming to the, uh, the idea of the, the cluster apartment or the shared flat. So I'm part of a group of about 23 people We've, we're considered as a sub-project. We have our own contract with the cooperative. We have our own organization. We're our own structure. We've taken over two, two floors of one building. Uh, here some of us are during the planning phase. So we had the opportunity really to, to uh, with our own architects, um, design and plan, develop our own living environments including interior spaces, community spaces, private spaces, but also the social organization and the financing. Here we are during the construction phase. Um, a big part of it is, is, is making things like lamps or other parts of our interior environment. Here we are, this is my, my particular shared flat or cluster group. Uh, we do something like an annual retreat um, discussing our, our own situation, how we're living together, what we're sharing, how we can uh, perhaps make improvements, uh, what our visions are for the future of our particular group. A big part of it is uh, cooking and eating together, uh, not just birthdays and other parties. Uh, for myself, having grown up as an American, here we are celebrating Thanksgiving in the last couple of years. Um, and quite often having people from the media come by. So here was uh, a team from Al Jazeera uh, <coughs> filming in our community kitchen, getting an idea what that can look like where people are, are actually sharing a kitchen as part of their daily lives. Um, a summary of uh, what I think is significant about the Spreefeld, so I can't stress it enough th that the, uh, the form of ownership is, is significant more in the long term than in the short term. And so my particular idea, which I share with a lot of people in Berlin, of community, or, uh, or when I talk about commoning, then it's not just having spaces to share, or it's not just cooking and eating together, but it means sharing the ownership. It means sharing the ownership of the land as well as the building. So 
taken it a bit out of the private realm, certainly taken it away from the idea of speculation. The idea of the cooperative means, uh, again, not just meeting each other and talking and being nice to each other, but, uh, but actually sharing, uh, in an econ economic sense, the ownership. And I think that, that, ends, that leads us to a different idea of community and certainly a different idea of the commons. Um, other things, I won't go through the whole list here. Um, the ecological side, I haven't spent as much time talking about it. I'm certainly interested in the idea of saving energy and saving water and saving space and the idea of the compact city. Uh, but I think that the social architecture and the questions of ownership uh, demand uh, more of our attention these days. I was just talking with, with Davey this morning and an idea that I think some of us share if we're talking about sustainability and regeneration, then our, our, our examples, our, our case studies, or our co-housing projects, they have to demonstrate, they should demonstrate, and I think it's possible, that living in a sustainable way, or perhaps in a way that gets started with this process of regeneration, can show us that this means an improvement in quality of life, and it's not just you know being good people and saving water and space and living in a compact way, but it actually means uh, that we're improving our quality of lives. And so I think that's, that's the great challenge for architects and for co-housing developers to um, help people take steps with that, which means to, yeah, really improvements in our lives and not just being, like I say, you know, nice and good people who are, are, are saving. Um, finally, I'm coming to the conclusions here. I call it Lessons Learned. Uh, with the Sprayfeld, uh, as with all projects, <laughs> If, if, if we look at it, um, looking back, there are things we could have done better. So speaking openly about that, uh, there are some things that we wanted to do differently in the beginning, it didn't work out. But recommendations to others developing projects, this is, this is what I would recommend. Number one, separate the ownership of the land from the building. So a cooperative is great. What we really wanted to do, we, we bought this land from the federal government we wanted to get the city of Berlin to buy the land. Plan B was to get a, a nonprofit foundation to buy the land and lease it from us. We didn't have the idea or we didn't have the community land trust structure in Berlin at that time, but that could have also been a model. Work with the community land trust, uh, give them the land and lease the land from them for the long term. Um, in any case, the cooperative bought the land uh, <coughs> became the owner of the land and the buildings, which has given us a bit of stress. Uh, number two, so the question was asked yesterday, and so I'm emphasizing this today. I'm, I'm, I'm very much uh, in support of including uh, mixed tenure in particular projects, especially if they're large enough, like ours is. You know, if you've got 100, 200 people living, in a new neighborhood, then definitely. And I think it should be consciously included people, renting people, owning people, uh, living in cooperative structures next to each other. What this means is that people with different economic means can, can afford to live in a particular neighborhood next to each other. They don't all have to buy. Some of them don't want to buy. Um, I will just mention it today or this morning. Maybe we can come back to it later. In our particular cooperative, we, we added uh, an unnecessary bit of complication, but we have an ownership option, which means that some people in the coming year will have the right to buy their apartment from the cooperative, so we will end up with a mix of renters and owners. We could have done that better and, and had more clarity from the beginning. Um, we could have done better. We, we have a lot of commercial space, which I think is fantastic in the sense of, uh, of creating an urban neighborhood. Again, it's not just people living there, but people working there. Um, we could have given this commercial space a bit more direction in terms of uh, uh, being clear about what's, what's expected uh, from renters in these spaces. Um, we could have had a stronger vision of our cooperative, not just doing this one project, but going on to develop other projects. Cooperative structures usually have that ability to develop and maintain housing, um, 
to actually do that, you have to have it from the beginning, and, and as we are, we're a one-project cooperative, which has its limitations. And finally, five, last but not least, we could have had a better strategy for contract resolution from the beginning. A lot of middle-class people think they uh, can talk their way out of everything and, 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 and assume there are no problems too great for them, uh, but that's wrong. And co-housing is, is a sort of thing which is new for a lot of people, people sharing spaces, and that leads to conflict. And so from the very beginning, and architects usually don't have this training, communications training, social skills, moderation facilitation skills to help groups not just make decisions but resolve conflict. And this is something we've had to learn in a painful way in the last years, which I think we're dealing with, but uh, words uh, for the, the next generations to do these things right from the beginning. So I think I've used up my time. Thanks for your attention and look forward to the discussions today.